Five, four, three, Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Future of Experience Design. Um, we have a great lineup of panelists today um, in partnership with the Bay Area, I'm trying to remember all of this, UX, UI, XD design group. Um, we, uh, I'm from Adobe. My name is Colleen Chow, and I work with the UX design group. And we brought together this group of panelists to talk about the future of experience design and how the role of the designer is changing. And we wanted to bring together this diverse group of panelists to bring their unique perspectives and to share you know, their point of view and their strategies for how to evolve alongside um, experience design. Um, we're going to be taking questions at the end of the evening um, exclusively from Twitter. So please use the hashtag feature of XD, one word. Um, and we'll be collecting those questions to ask the panelists at the end of our conversation, which will be about an hour. So we'll get to as many of those questions as possible. Um, so please tweet um, your questions to us. And I'm next going to just pass it over to our moderator is Vincent Hardy. He's the Director of Engineering at Adobe for UX Design. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Vincent. All right. Thanks, Colleen. Thanks. So yeah, welcome everybody. Welcome uh, everybody who's following uh, online as well. Uh, we'll we'll go right away. Start with uh, we've got a great great set of designers and people it's super experienced in XD. So we'll start with introduction. So so the panel is going to go around starting with Nancy on uh, you know what you do, you know where you work and your you know your role in relative to XD. Great. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Nancy Duignon. Uh, I work at Google. I'm a user experience researcher and program manager there. I uh, primarily focus on end-to-end -end experience of critical launches and serve sort of as a consultant, so to speak, a UX consultant within a support at Google. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Marissa Gallagher. I work at Amazon Music. I run the UX and design department there. and. We're in the process of, we work on a number of apps from iOS, Android, desktop, web player, some stuff on Fire TV and Echo. Um, before that, I, I studied undergrad anthropology and film, and I just, I've always loved being a part of a new medium. So it's such, so cool that we're able to do that. And so I've, I've been really lucky to work at a couple of startups and a big design agency at, uh, called Razorfish. And then uh, at CNN, I ran the UX and the design department there. I'm Don Getz. I'm a senior UX designer at Integrated Computer Solutions, ICS. Uh, we're a development and design shop um, focusing on touch-enabled devices. Um, a lot of unconventional types of uh, cool. devices, which we'll end up talking about later. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is James DeAngelis. Uh, I work at the product design team at Pinterest. I work on the collaboration team. Uh, and kind of on that team, I kind of help people discover and do things that they care about together. Uh, before working at Pinterest, I was running a little design studio uh, in Sydney, in Australia, uh, but mm. most recently moved to the US to, to work at Pinterest. Hi, everyone. I'm Daniel. Uh, I work for Method. That's uh, the design studio, not the soap company. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm on the, one of the interaction designers there. Um, what I've been trying to do a lot since going there is encouraging the people I work with to always very, very quickly and early on ask questions by designing and then using these artifacts that they design to get answers and ask new questions. Mm -hmm. Hi all, uh, I'm Burton Rask. I'm an interaction and software designer at IDEO here in San Francisco. Um, IDEO has long championed a process that we call human-centered design. Um, truthfully, I think whether it's user-centered design or, or UX or XD, these are all kind of colloquial evolutions of the same idea. Um, everything that we do is, is through that kind of human-centered lens, everything from research to prototyping, user testing, and, and eventually handing off our deliverables. Cool. All right. I'm Talon Wadsworth, and I'm a designer at Adobe, and I'm the lead designer right now on Project Comet uh, at Adobe. So. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, thanks uh, all of you. So you're... And you're all like very expert in your uh, in your field. That's you know why you, you're you're here, and you know you see a lot of work and you do a lot of work yourself. So there 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 are traps in design, right? Like talking to each of you uh, earlier, like you know you all mentioned like different areas that you felt were uh, were dangerous or uh, for uh, in the exercise of uh, experience design. Um, so you know, Nancy, you want to share a little bit about the, like your your view on you know things you've 
I think designers may fall into and, and how to actually overcome those, uh, those traps. Uh, so um, one thing that's really interesting is that people assume if something is cool, that means it's usable. <laughs> and so um, and it, the truth of the matter is a lot of users can look at something and say, oh, wow, that's super cool and still not use it. So it's really, really important that you have a use case for the things that you're designing for. Otherwise, you're building things and wasting resources. Um, and so uh, one way to do that is by doing research. Um, so that's my little plug. <laughs> right? Um, and really understanding what a user's needs are and whether there is a need for this particular thing. And so I have seen countless designs kind of go through. And um, I would advise that if you do have a researcher uh, on your team to speak with them because there are some assumptions yeah. that you might have that mm -hmm. could be cleared up if you do speak to uh, somebody who may have some knowledge of heuristics or uh, things with users. Yeah, that reminds me of what, what, something, Burton, you were mentioning earlier about user research, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, truthfully, I think the, the biggest pitfall in experience design is that it's really easy to kind of design for ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. We forget that the rest of the world, and, and even many folks in America, yeah. they're not using these kind of ultra-premium smartphones or laptops mm -hmm. on reliable, kind of always connected, you know, high-speed Wi-Fi and LTE networks. Mm -hmm. uh, a great example of this I read a couple of years ago, Facebook sent a bunch of their Android team to travel all around rural Africa. They bought these oh. kind of pay-as-you-go burner phones and really quickly realized that you know, low bandwidth, kind of intermittent, um, unreliable networks caused for constant crashes. Uh, they burned through their entire monthly data plan in 40 minutes <laughs> uh, and realized that they needed to make some, some major changes to the app, right? So yeah. when we talk about user experience, we're, you know, these days, uh, I, I think we spend a, lot too much, uh, a bit too much time talking about like, user experience with regard to polish, you know, mm -hmm. animation, transition, things that cause for surprise and delight. But you know, when you consider the user experience, you need to consider a more kind of holistic approach, right? Like, what's the user experience of burning through uh, someone's monthly data plan with an irresponsibly kind of bloated, uh, over uh, overdeveloped bloated app um, that that kind of ruins someone's ability to to use their phone for the rest of the month? Yeah, yeah I have this poster on my desk that says. Innovate as a last resort. <laughs> that's, a, that's a Charles Eames quote. And while you know he's a guy, I think, kind of known for kind of his innovative take, he really kind of you know like you said, like focus on like how are people, what's the real situation on the ground? Like how are people actually using mm -hmm. software, engaging with experiences, and and build on that, right? Like we don't have we don't have a blank, we don't always have a blank canvas to build from, and we can take advantage of a lot of the research and data that has come before right, to to build really solid foundation for our experiences. Yeah. It's interesting actually what you're saying about bloat, because I remember. Um, Clothes designer Coco Chanel always used to say, before you leave the house, there's always one piece of clothing that you can take off. Right. And you can kind of apply that to design also. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Just, yeah. I hope it's not a onesie. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. All right. So um, thanks. So I mean, you, you talked about like, you know, a trap, like, you know, do, doing like a really thing about the user first and, uh, and uh, you know, having that view, not just get caught about the, the, the mechanics of what you're doing. Uh, so when you have to deliver that feedback, you know, that can be mm. kind of a little difficult. And I know a question that we, you know, we've talked about that you, you all actually were really passionate about is, uh, is critique. So, you know, there is, uh, and there are companies like, you know, everybody must have heard of Pixar and how they actually approach, you know, why Pixar does so, you know, such good movies is probably because they have an awesome critique process inside their, their company and they're able to actually have people absorb and, and use uh, critique. Uh, and I know, uh, you know uh, we were talking earlier, uh, James, and Pinterest, that you know, that actually has inspired some of Pinterest's way of, of you know, dealing with critiques. So, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there's, uh, there's this idea that Pixar has this notion of the brain trust. Mm. And the, the brain trust is this trusted set of directors that have done many films and done many kind of awesome things. And mm -hmm. if, you're a, if you're a person you know, pitching an idea, you can rely on this, this set of awesome <laughs> folks that kind of have that experience to sort of uh, bounce their ideas off and stuff. And, it's something that, that's sort of set root in Pinterest, and it's, I think it's one of the, the things that make our design team so strong is that this critique culture is like, you know, it's based on this sort of brain trust system. So you have these design leads, and uh, so I think that kind of that setup really helps. Yeah. Um, but I think the second thing too, in, in kind of giving feedback within that in that sphere, is really important. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that, that that I try and do is, uh, you know, rather than being prescriptive, like change this, do this, is to try and understand their their line of thinking mm -hmm. because. You know, oftentimes they, they might have missed out a critical piece in that kind of stack. And if I can kind of identify that and I can help them out, 
uh, you know, it's really, it's the most helpful thing that, the, that I can do versus like make the button blue or like move that over here or something, so. Yeah, oftentimes yeah. they can even start to do it themselves. Like it's, right. that's the best part of like, if you know them and, and you sort of ask them some questions and you're like, oh wait, is that, what do you think of it? Where mm -hmm. do you think it's, it's missing some things? They sort of, all right. of us have like that, that instinct of like, oh, this is, the this is the part I don't want you to look at. Like, <laughs> this is where I'm not quite sure. And so that's, yeah. isn't it, it's so cool to be able to think about them as users too. Like, Definitely. what is their customer journey? What's their journey with the experience? I've actually found yeah. um, when you are, you know, chatting with someone about their work, especially in something like experience design where quite often they're designing, you know, one component amongst many. Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite useful to just ask people like why they're designing what they're designing. Yeah. Because uh, quite often like the why in experience design is a context mm -hmm. of that component that you're designing for within all the others. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and yeah, I think if you can't start off asking, when, especially maybe when people are stuck, ask them like why they're designing what they're designing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you can understand at least if they've understood the problem area that they're designing for. Yeah. Like the, the five whys, but also when we're talking, Nancy, you were mentioning there is uh, so there's questioning the design, but there's also understanding the, um, the the motivation behind critique, and you know, are are people trying to, you know, what are people really trying to achieve with their design, or or the validation of their design versus learning about their design. Right. Sometimes when we're working with folks, it's not actually designers that are coming to us with ideas. Right. You're working mm -hmm. with all these different people who have all this cool feedback they want to give you, but you know, it's really important to let them know that if you're going to be speaking with us, you may not get a yes or a, you know it's almost as if sometimes people come to you looking for validation for their answers mm -hmm. so um, I actually play an exercise with folks uh, a game of assumptions that our team has been doing where we'll give them some true or false questions um, or um, have them try to solve a few things just to make sure that they understand they are coming uh, forward with a lot of assumptions so it's really interesting when we give them some information and they realize oh wow that's not true mm -hmm. and here's the reason why to really kind of take the feedback and the critique that we're giving them as, you know, solid yeah. and based off of actual information that we've done a lot of research on. Yeah. I think the best feedback really comes when both the person being critiqued and the person sort of giving the feedback, there's a level of trust there. You know, yeah. that's something that I think that we've tried to do on, on my team is really like build a level of trust so that, you know, like, I mean, we're, you know, designers are kind of, we, we've got egos, uh, and we have, you know, we have feelings and all that, and I think that when we can build that level of, of trust, uh, you know, like, it just, it just makes that, the, those exchange of ideas just flow that much better, and I think that, that makes it, you know, even, even more valuable when you, when you give feedback, so. Especially, I find especially even uh, with younger um, and newer mm -hmm. UX designers, um, they're very often scared, they, they think you're attacking them, and right. to, to always let them know that it's not an attack of them, and it's not an attack on their design either, it's yeah. just, there's many different ways we can do it, and this might be a better way, this might help, your way might be the best way. Mm -hmm. It just, that's, the, the, the critique helps the design process. Truthfully, I think, ultimately, <laughs> that you're, you're testing with users and allowing users to either validate or invalidate design decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, for us, that's, that's the best way forward. Um, certainly, we, we critique one another internally uh, on our project teams, but you know, at the end of the day, be it, you know, via the research that helps us to define the problem up front or, mm -hmm. you know, when we're refining an idea um, to, to test with, with real world users is, I mean, there's no, there's no better validation. I mean, the thing, right, the IDEO saying that I think I've quoted before, right, the prototype is worth a thousand meetings, right, like the <laughs> feedback right from... I was, I was totally the one who said that. There, there you can <laughs> look at that. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Confession, yeah. I was not the one who said that. <laughs> Yeah. So the yeah. So we're, we're talking about like the you know the idea of valid like design is you, you're really creating a solution to a problem and you know that, like, it's all about the critique is should or really all be about the validation of that solution. Mm -hmm. So talking about like specific solution, they, you know one challenge today for a lot of you know uh, UX designers is really to deal with like multi you know modality devices. You know like uh, input you know text oh, sorry touch keyboard you know mouse and all the things having to work together with a pen and all that. So uh, I, I don't tell you know you're, you're faced with some of that. So do, you know how do you, you know how do you deal with those problems? What's your design solution to, to dealing with multiple I mean, interfaces? You know, that's such a huge problem, and I mean it's changing so much right now. And I think that you know the thing that I try to do is kind of ground it in like active use. Like wh what? How are people using voice right now? And how are people using touch? Mm -hmm. And how are people m making use of a device that has you know a hybrid of inputs? And I think that what I've tried to do is sort of like first just kind of you know, see what people are doing and then yeah. try and use that to maybe optimize something. I think in, in my case for like the creation process, you know, how can I, you know, 
you know, optimize some design task that we, you know, we used to do just with a mouse and a keyboard, and how can, how can that be better or be faster, you know, by using multiple types of inputs, and again, not going too far with it, and not going too crazy, I want people to come along with me on this journey, and, and you know, learn, a, they're going to learn something, you know, to, to do something in a new way, so we want to sort of, again, just kind of take advantage of kind of the best practices, um, to, and just evolve it in ways that, that we can all kind of move forward together, um, and figure out the best solution, so. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Marissa, I believe you'd be working with voice a little bit. Right. And yeah. so it, and it, I think it's, it's tricky. What, what I loved is like when you were talking about a little bit with Facebook going out in the field. I think that there's nothing, what's awesome about all of these multimodal experiences is they do force us to get away from our machines a little bit. Like I know this is an Adobe talk and, and we, all, we all use the tools. It can be so hard to get stuck in the tools. And so I'm excited about, about these different types of experiences because they really do force us to think about the user and the customer journey and to sit there and go back and observe people, get back into the research and understand how people are dealing with it and get back to that logic. And so I've really found a lot of connections with just the logic and how people move through really getting back down to that customer journey, mm -hmm. which, is, which is exciting. So it gets us back. All right, thanks. So, so that's one type of you know, possible big challenge, but uh, I'm sure you, you deal with very difficult problems every day. So there's one question I wanted to also ask every, every one of you on, like, could you talk about like, the biggest kind of challenge you've had recently and you know, how you actually overcame it? Like, you know, like really a design challenge you had, what solution you came up with and why you think it was good? Uh, so my, mine's are a little less design challenges. I think when, well, we come together, I think the, the hardest thing that I have is saying no, and it tends to be 70% of the time, <laughs> right? Um, and so, and then trying to explain to people why the no is legitimate, right? And so, uh, sometimes I can prove it with research and data a lot. We're a very metric-centered company at Google, and so uh, sometimes people just don't feel like that's enough. And so, mm -hmm. um, empowering people to go back in, uh, maybe bring back additional information, giving them some feedback such as, um, okay, well, if you can provide me with resources that can actually build this out, then maybe we can consider um, a different solution or giving them something out of it. Maybe not the whole idea works, but we can take a bit of some things and say, okay, this isn't going to work, but maybe we can work with the small aspect here, or maybe you can build upon this aspect here, um, and then come back to it. But a lot of the times, we don't want to send things out the door that just feel good to people, right? And so um, it's really important to say no and, and really push back and um, really practice your influence. Yeah. I think the biggest design challenge I've had to face is we, we have so many platforms all at once. I think you guys probably have this too. You guys all have it where we have iOS, Android, we have a desktop client, we have a web player, we have this Fire TV experience, we have a, an Echo device, and then we have an SDK. And so things had gotten completely out of sync. I mean, because it's crazy, right? So what we had to do is really get people back to a common experience. And a big thing for us was to do some ethnography. So we hadn't done it in a while. We actually went out and just went into people's homes and saw how people listen to music. I mean, that's, it sounds simple, but you need to do it sometimes. And it, what it did was for the design team, it is helped reground us into what we're actually about. What are the goals and really get us back in the user centered. And then we had to do some exercises to get all on the same page with navigation and all of that. But it's, that is sort of a key thing. Definitely there's additional pieces around tools. I'd love to hear you guys, how you approach it. I mean, all of us are trying to work it out. So, but that's, that's been a good challenge and to try and do it all at once. So. I think our challenge is a little different. Um, we, we're not like a bigger company and we don't have like a product that we do. We're consulting firms, so we're working with a lot of different companies and our company almost often works with medium to smaller sized companies. So our biggest problem is just getting in, getting buy-in still. Um, I, I found in my, not in my experience that a lot of the West Coast and a lot of the Eastern Corridor companies um, buy into UX, and it's, it's really big. Obviously, here in San Francisco, it's a very big thing, but we do a lot of work with companies in the Midwest and, the, and more Southern-based companies, which it's, it's not, they, there are companies, obviously, that buy in, but they don't buy in as quickly or as much, so 
they want to try to skip testing and just have us do uh, wireframe right. design, and they don't want to pay for the testing. So getting, just getting them to know that testing and checking with the users is what really gets you the information that you need to make a good design, mm -hmm. and that product managers and subject matter experts aren't always the user. They're not, a lot of times they'll give you 80% of the information you need, but that 20%, mm -hmm. you have to really talk to users. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's funny you mentioned that. We actually have a, a similar-ish style problem at Pinterest. Uh, it's very symptomatic of a company at our scale. And, uh, you know, th there's so much focus from designers on, like, the craft of design. Mm -hmm. It's, like, all day about, like, prototyping right. and how can I sand it, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff. And that is obviously very important. Um, but I think one of the things that we've had to overcome recently is as we've scaled so fast, mm -hmm. the selling of design has mm -hmm. become as important, or if not more important, than doing the design itself. Yeah. And uh, so, I, you know, I'd really say that, like, spending time with the story about the design has been one of the biggest things that, we, as a team, we've overcome because yeah. it's not just uh, to, a, to an executive committee or to whoever else, it's to your engineers, it's to other designers, to yourself, uh, maybe it's a co-founder that you have. Um, so that story about design is just very undervalued, I think, by a lot of people. So investing cycles there and doing that really right has just paid, paid dividends. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'd recommend that. <laughs> Yeah, I think like one kind of specific example to experience design was we were working on a, a wearable camera um, mm. and we didn't really have any hardware to work with so we just strapped some GoPros to people's chests and sent them out in the field and you know and just from that just from looking at the footage and from speaking to them afterwards we had this kind of point of view which was uh, life should be lived through your eyes and not you know through your camera lens mm -hmm. and that was a kind of like experience we were designing for so we kind of like moved from this shift of like designing the experience to designing for the experience mm -hmm. and all of a sudden we realized that you know we were like designing a camera that wasn't going to have a viewfinder we weren't going to encourage you to tether it to your phone um, and yeah. it would it would be very difficult for this camera to communicate to you like when it's on and when it's off and when it's recording or when it's not so that kind of, you know, we ended up with these quite significant challenges, like this is going to create a lot of junk data, and what can we do about that, and how should the buttons work? Um, and, and then so to, to kind of solve that problem um, about the junk data, we had to design an algorithm um, that would be able to sift through the data, and then to test it, and that's going to take like a month to produce, and we can't wait a month to test if like that's the right way to do it, but because we knew the parameters of the algorithm, we were able to take the footage that the people had filmed and simulate the algorithm hmm. to see if, you know, how it was filtering the content, you know, is something that could work. Um, yeah. Over cool. to you. <laughs> so, uh, a really fun challenge that, that comes up on every project that I tend to enjoy is during the research phase, um, finding the right analog to, to really inspire you know, a, a great design or, or a new product or, or service. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, uh, we were doing a, uh, uh, we were building a tool for people to better understand and make sense of their 401k, right? So we looked at uh, other 401k products in the market and unsurprisingly, they were pretty lamentable. Um, I think naturally, you know, it, it's, it's easy to just kind of look to something that is then, you know, similar but not the same to try to drive inspiration, whereas, we, in, in that case, we tend to take a really big step back uh, and ask, ask ourselves, you know, what is it that, that we're trying to solve for here, right? And what a 401k tool is about is, is you know, at, at the highest level is about managing risk and reward, right? So we chose to talk to, uh, of all people, well, we went skydiving is, is the short <laughs> version. So, <laughs> so our whole team went skydiving and then talked to the instructor afterwards. We interviewed the, the skydiving instructor because yeah. this is a guy who has to manage risk right? You could die uh, <laughs> with reward uh, that you might have a great experience while not dying. Um, so we gleaned really, really valuable insights from this guy that, that drove us to create something, you know, that was in the end really fantastic. And that's, like I said, it's, it's an interesting challenge. You know, it, it can be pretty difficult uh, to come up with just right, the right one. But when you do and you nail it, you know, it, it can be a really inspirational moment. Plus, you get to go skydiving. And you get to go there skydiving. You go. Lots of sure. adventure. Yeah. <laughs> All 
All right, so I, I have this uh, feature that a lot of people have been asking me about, and I, I won't say what it is, but it's layers. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's definitely been like a hot topic, and I've had a lot of people asking me, and, and I, you know, how do you tackle such a huge problem that has a lot of emotion tied to it, I've found. Uh, people love their layers, and they like to manage them and name them and do lots of things with them. And so I, I was like, well, where do I start? I can start with how I use layers, which uh, I, I don't much. Um, so I had to go and start and just talk to people and just see how they use layers and really and like get down to the heart of like, what are you doing here all day long in these tools that has the, sort of built up this attachment? And so, uh, you know, after talking to a lot of people, um, the first thing to do was prototype it. You know, the first thing to do was just was, was see it working, mm -hmm. see it real. You know, I had some ideas. I'd taken a lot of, uh, done, done some, some of my own research. Um, kind of one of the things I think that design has looked to more and more, right, is to, is to really be relied on to do the research up front and uh, actually bring that to, to bear when you're prototyping. And then, again, getting it to feel as real as, as possible, as quickly as possible, to validate those ideas was really kind of the key component. And actually through that process um, and getting there and seeing it and feeling it and interacting with it actually led to more solutions, mm -hmm. um, which I think, again, it just shows to, again, the, just the why prototyping is so important and making it real and feeling it in your hand is, is just uh, so integral to what we're doing anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, it just led to better solutions in the end. And I think, again, ways that really we can optimize and make a better experience through it. So. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. It's fascinating like, the, how, how important the process of design, when I hear you know, all of your responses, like the process of designing is you know, at any step seems as important, if not even more important than the, uh, the design itself, right? the design that's in question. Uh, one thing, Burton, you, you just mentioned is actually inspiration, uh, and you know it seems to be a, a big part of, of of design. So, could you could you talk more? And you know, maybe others will also want to jump in on this question. But you know, where where do you find inspiration in that world? Right, like there's a process you're trying to you know, get user input and all that, but you also want to be creative and and be inspired by people. So, how do you how do you, you you mentioned one example, but you want to talk more about this? Uh, yeah, I mean, apart from kind of looking for. Um kind of high-level analogous uh, people to talk to or, or products or services to look to that, that might not look or feel anything like what it is that you're creating or, or do anything like what, what it is that you're trying to solve. Um, I mean, shout out to Nancy uh, Research, right? Like, there's, <laughs> <laughs> there's I, I really, I, I think most of us at IDEO tend not to look to, you know, other work in the industry for inspiration. A lot of the time, we're, we're creating for uh, someone who isn't us, right? And, and uh, we're, we're trying to create a product that isn't ours to experience or, or isn't intended to make our lives better. So, mm -hmm. you know, the more immersive uh, you can get in, in your observation and research and, and kind of talk to people in the real world, not focus groups. We don't do focus groups. I could do an hour on why we don't do focus <laughs> groups alone. Um, but yeah, the, those are the folks who, who are going to inspire you by, by telling you their stories and, and giving you an understanding of what it is that, that they need you to solve for. What's cool is like some of the stuff, like thinking about method, just like learning from other creatives and from other creative processes. Like I feel like I learn a lot from physical product design so much. Like mm -hmm. you were the ones that first taught us to go out there and prototype. Like just to like you're talking about the camera. Like mm -hmm. you s with with physical products, you just need to like start building like squares and start putting <laughs> them up. And so. And we didn't always do that, I would say. With digital stuff, it, definitely we tried to do a lot of paper prototyping, but we would be a little bit hesitant. And so I mm -hmm. feel like that's made a big difference and, and definitely architecture. And in other different fields, I get, I get inspired so much by music or seeing a beautiful building or sort of seeing those analogous kinds of concepts of how, to, how do people try to approach genres. Is, is that the, the concept of uh, design cross-training that, uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, yes. it's, it makes such a big difference, right? Okay. Like, it's such a similar process, so, yeah. I know for me, I get inspired from really bad design. <laughs> very, very bad. Cool. Especially um, what's really interesting is that I'm, I'm Haitian-American, and so, I, and I spend, a, I, I travel a lot, and so even seeing how the designs we build in the U.S. are misused, misused, right, or um, are used differently in other places, it's, like, fascinating to me. Um, um, I was in an Uber uh, in, in Nigeria, and I asked the driver why he would not use his maps. And he's like, Uber doesn't work here. Like, I mean, it, the maps don't understand the roads here and this and that. I'm like, well, then how are we going to get around? He's like, Twitter. <laughs> Quite literally. 
they tweet out to their own people to get advice about where to go, right? And so like, that's really inspirational to me to understand from other cultural practices, which is really something I'm very passionate about, how to design for these different cultures, um, and also to seek inspiration from them, because there's some, some cool stuff that you know, Twitter might want to grab there, <laughs> you know? I think the, the last thing, and maybe this is like a, di a different way of looking at, at the question, is um, you know, there's, there's things that are directly apply to the thing that you're working on right now. Yeah. Um, but you know, working at Pinterest, um, one of the things that I've really found value in is the process of collecting. Mm -hmm. And collecting is a really great way to get, you to, get to, your own, to know your own taste. Mm -hmm. right. And um, you, know, when you, you can spot these patterns over time and get to know these, you know, these certain things. Yeah. So I think collecting is one of the, the most uh, you know, fruitful things you can do as a creative because you know, over time you can, you can start to know yourself a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, and so personally, like, you know, developing, uh, sorry, collecting things like you know, physical products and, and things like sculpture and uh, mm -hmm. things that aren't related directly. Mm -hmm. But once you build this collection, it becomes this source of inspiration and, and resource that, uh, that might be expected r right now, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah. It's so unconscious. Like, yeah. It's like right. you, you don't even realize that you have a pattern forming, until, and then all of a sudden you do. Like totally, it's, yeah. it's really neat. Cool process. There's yeah. definitely something in inspiration about just being curious in general. Right. Well, I mean, just just trying the latest thing, or you know, being on that. I think you know, as designers, we're probably on that that first wave of a lot of things, and I think it's because we're always kind of searching for that new opportunity, that or that new idea, and I think that 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 you know helps me stay kind of you know creative in my day to day. So, like, so that's that's interesting. So there, there, you guys have talked about like you know positive patterns and negative patterns and things not to do. Um, I mean, if a pattern gets used over and over again, it becomes a, it becomes a trend, right? And uh, so you see trends in, uh, in design like you do in, in many things. Uh, one, you know, one that's been talked about is like this notion of invisible UI. Um, and Marissa, I thought you'd want to talk about this because you've been working on Echo, which has like no, yeah, you know, no traditional UI screen touch UI or anything. It's a voice yeah. thing, so it's, it's kinda, it could be an extreme of literally being an invisible UI in that sense. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. But it, I, I like it. I like visible, <clears throat> invisible UI, or like particularly something like Echo and designing for voice. Is that I'm just getting into it. There's there's folks that have been doing voice UX for a long time, but what's beautiful about it is it really gets you back. It's felt like it's gotten me back to the to the user and to really thinking through. Sorry about that. Uh, um, thank you, Nancy. Um, getting getting back to the user and getting back to the customer journey mm -hmm. and really thinking about mm -hmm. the logic of just the conversation. So Alexa, play music. No, I don't have that. Okay, and you, what's the interaction? Mm -hmm. Like, you really want to start talking to the device, and so that could be fun, but it it could be, it isn't the only thing for yeah. sure. Like, I I like the I like right. UI too. Yeah. Well, yeah, actually, Dan, we we're touching touching a little bit of, uh, on that topic earlier when we were talking mm -hmm. about you know I think it's more traditional UI is like this notion of is a UI you know disappearing in the sense of like so it's so seamless that you don't really realize you're interacting with something. And is that a good thing, or is that just a fad? Um, I, th I think like one of the great things about a graphical user interface or a physical user interface is that the affordances tell you what the thing does. So when you look at a blender and it's got a power button and a fruit and a carrot, like that tells you what this object is about mm -hmm. and what it does and how to use it. Um, I've, I've been dying to get hold of the Amazon Echo. Uh, one of the things I wonder about is, you know, we take that analogy, it's like even someone who may come into my apartment who has never seen my blender would understand how to use it. And then with something like the invisible UI, it's like the interface disappears, so the affordances disappear. Mm -hmm. So two questions that I'm interested in is one, like how do you know what this thing does, what its purpose is? Because if somebody walks into my apartment and looks at the Echo, he or she may just think it's a speaker. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is, what is the scope of what this thing can do? Yeah. And you know, this blender has five buttons. I know that it can do carrots and pears and peaches and smoothies. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I'm told that I can speak to this speaker, I don't know what I can ask it for. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess, like, I haven't done any work in this in this area, but I guess like, these are some of the challenges that arise from it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. It's and definitely it. around, like, I mean, I think you're right. I think we're getting to this space where the, there will be the opportunity for a voice to, to walk around with us and to mm -hmm. have, like, a personal assistant between Siri or Google Now or Alexa 
and we won't have the affordances anymore. And mm -hmm. how do we deal with that? Like a big issue is recall. Like you don't even know what to ask That's it. A, so yeah. recollection yeah. versus recognition. Yeah, and so where yeah. does the where does the GUI help? Like mm -hmm. how, where does the GUI or the physical product really help remind you or help sort of prompt you and, and get a conversation going or how do you trigger that? But it is it's such a, a fascinating part of design now. So yeah. maybe I'm, I'm go ahead. I was going to say, I think the, the Echo actually is a, it's a classic example of uh, this notion that invisible UI is like on the horizon, you know, it's like the movie Her or something, it's coming yeah. in, a, in a future. But, you know, I think if you think about product design as not so much making an interface, but sort of, you know, making an experience, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I feel like we're already doing so much of that. And I think the Echo is a great example, you know, it's not mm -hmm. about designing uh, buttons and components and stuff, it's making that experience. So I feel like we're already doing a lot of this intangible work. And, I mean, even in screen design, like, how do you, how do you like, quantify a sequence of screens, like an experience? Like, the, the pieces between those screens are, are invisible or intangible. So I think we're already doing a lot of that stuff, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah or even using, like, motion interaction to tell spatial stories or to, to talk about navigation, right? Instead mm -hmm. of just a simple back button, you really understand kind of spatially where you are out in the experience. And I think designers are just going to continue to utilize those tools like animation and interaction to, to you know, uh, tell a story. And, and yeah, I, th I still do see a role in some form of interface, I think, you know, and because we are communicators and because it is important for us to tell uh, a compelling story about why would I use this product and what do I do with it and where, where are we going in the future, you know? So. So, yeah, so we, we've just been talking about like a, a big challenge with you know the evolution of UIs and uh, uh, you know things like you know like no affordances and how you deal with this for, from a user experience point of view. Um, that reminds me of a conversation we again had a little earlier about um, you know staying creative and and conforming to uh, to, to existing uh, or to best practices. Uh, and taking on challenge, and uh, you know, I know James, who were talking about that, that concept of you know, maybe there's a element of emotional components there, like you know, fear about how you approach, uh, you know, your work. Yeah, so you, can I mean, you talk a little more about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like the, the biggest battle in being creative is fear. Actually, it's like it's it's the thing you're always kind of fighting against. Yeah. And uh, so the question is, how do I deal with this fear? Like, what mm -hmm. what are the tools that I have to sort of you know counteract that? Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that that I've used to to you know to help you know manage that fear is you know, trusting my process. It's that age-old thing that designers have because if you have this, this sequence of steps, you know that whatever comes, you can, you can throw it through this thing and, and it'll be okay. And I think part of that is like, you know, exploring problems exhaustively, like going through every single possible, you know, situation because then you know with some certainty at least that this is, is going to be a good solution with, with a few trade-offs. So I think managing fear in like a, is a weird thing to think about with creativity, but that allows you to stay on the edge, innovative, that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's a helpful tool. Yeah, I'm fascinated by some of your stuff, like with with how you you build for interfaces that like none of us have to build for. Like, how do you get through that fear? How do you use a consistent process to to do that? Um, well, so for everyone else, we were talking earlier that um, <clears throat> we do a lot of work with basically companies that a lot of the tech industry just or these other designers don't really think about. Like, we don't do a lot of cell phone, mobile phone, website stuff. We work on things like, I did a project recently with a, uh, it's a pressure monitor that goes in a hospital. So it's, these are nurses setting temperature and pressure and humidity and things like that on these little monitors that go in from one room to the next to the next. And uh, wow. it's, you actually have to go and talk to the people and see how they use it. Because um, sometimes, like, the, the, like I was saying, the subject matter experts think it's gonna be this way, but we gotta talk to the, the nurse who's actually using it. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the aspects of, besides just those front end users, a lot of these companies are also the installers and things like that. So yeah, yeah. you have to, the, all the steps that it takes to, to set up a pressure monitor in a hospital, it's wow. insane. Yeah. They have to check all the tubes, all the wiring, all that, and it's a lot of physical and uh, digital. So wow. set, making screens and design so that they can actually do that in a efficient flow, mm -hmm. it's just, a lot of work and it's a lot of things like that. Yeah. Thanks. And so, is it, what you're describing, like you know, some of the challenges, and sometimes you know, company the way they overcome this is to you know have like some best practices they establish for the apps, and you know some of you work in big companies, so mm -hmm. you have like that challenge sometimes to you you got I don't know your your guidelines for how you actually should be working as UX mm -hmm. designers or at least elements you need to put together, mm -hmm. and then at the same time being able to come up with a creative solution for the problems you're you're trying to solve. So how you know, I don't know any thoughts on on that, how you 
deal with it or what you tell your designer teams? Um, so, so we obviously do have a process and we, we try to stick to it, but in, at least in the consulting, we, we have to be flexible with the process. We always have to make sure that we're doing all the different parts of it okay. in that. But when things happen or different ways we do it, we try to be flexible because as, as a consulting firm, clients want different things. Like, unfortunately, there are a lot of clients that don't want to do testing because they don't want to pay for it. And mm -hmm. trying to figure out the way to get the best information possible without doing the research, which, which is tough and not the way we'd want to do it, but with a client, we'd have to do what the, um, the client wants. Yeah, I found the best thing when it comes to kind of like best practices uh, mm -hmm. is really about engaging with it and really, you know, evaluating it and instead of ignoring it as, you know, we are want to do sometimes and mm -hmm. try something completely new, completely different is really the best results. I mean, you know, at Adobe we have this challenge of working on, we have many products and, and we want to have and, and speak to users with a consistent voice and a consistent experience. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that I found uh, kind of working with the design group at Adobe is really when we engage with one another and we share and we collaborate, that we all grow together. And again, we don't throw out, you know, like the foundation. Like we really build on something. And I think in the end, we end up with, with a more kind of cohesive story uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, I think you're right. Because it's, I mean, we, we deal with that a lot at Amazon. So there's the core shopping team and there's a search team. And we don't deal with any of that. Like we create our own experiences and we could go completely off the reservation if we wanted to. But there are places where it totally helps us. and. To be honest, there's a bunch of great designers that are yeah. super smart. So, like, they're coming up with something that's interesting, and they're coming up with sort of a uh, a trend of how they're moving through the experience. And for us to know, like, where they're heading within the next 18 months or two years, completely helps us think about how to streamline where we're heading to, so we all start to converge. And that it can be, it really can help us actually get out of a block. Yeah. It can help us. Yeah. It can help us see beyond ourselves a bit, which is. Awesome. Yeah. What, what, did you say you're on the music team? Yeah. So, I don't know, for example, like what would be the qualities of the shopping experience that, that need to be manifested or in the in the music experience? I think like part of it is the like search, and search okay. in particular. So is a pretty big one where definitely there's a browse experience for that. But there's often like people are looking for Janet Jackson or they're looking for I want to find the specific track on. The Mumford and Sons second album, and maybe the acoustic version. So them understanding, they've done so much research on search and mm -hmm. like really understanding how to optimize for that and understand intents if someone is coming in and really knows what they want or is really coming in sort of to graze um, mm -hmm. and how to move people through that. And so that helps us think through, okay, how to simplify that. They're also, as a design team, really tapped into the overall community too. And so they're thinking about things in a similar way that we are in terms of trying to bring the content up mm -hmm. and trying to get the experience tighter. And so that, that tends to be where we see it. So it, it's almost at a philosophical level, but okay. then also in a functional level, like how does search work in music or how does shopping, where's, where are people wanting to buy an experience or where they may be aligned to an author or an artist in the same kind of way? But yeah. Thanks. So yeah. So yeah, I think you, what I'm hearing you guys talk about is like you're, you know, yes, you're being flexible with, you know, with those best practices or kind of guidelines you have in the company. You're kind of trying to understand designs and, and really get back to the basics of problem solving and and where those things are useful. Those guidelines usually come in when there's a well-known problem or well well-known type of interface you're you know you're building for. Um, I was talking to you know, several of you again before that, uh, that you're not always working on the traditional you know iPad or uh, or, or desktop you know computer. You're sometimes working on, on unconventional unconventional uh, interfaces. So uh, I know Burton, you do that at IDEO quite a bit. So you know, can you can you talk about like the type of like unusual environment you're in, or the kind of things you expect in the in the future to be working on? Uh, sure. Um, <clears throat> so traditional UI, like screen design, be it you know desktop, uh, um, mobile, smartphone, is a very tiny piece of what we do, right? We have uh, a lot of, of designers from wildly disparate disciplines. Um, <clears throat> so our, our teams are multidisciplinary. You, you, you typically have like a business designer, design researcher, interaction software, and then maybe someone who does, we call it environments. Uh, folk, other folks would call that architectural interiors things like that. So um, a lot of the experiences that we're creating um, are, you know, getting into what's what's becoming, well, what's now being called kind of these smart spaces. Um, 
I guess some of that uh, uh, kind of aligns with the invisible UI that you were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Some of these spaces uh, you're either deliberately interacting with or the space is kind of affording you what you want before you've even asked for it. So yeah, I'd say those tend to be pretty non-traditional when you're talking about user interfaces. What, uh, what excites me the most is that there's no like 12 column grid in the real world, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't have to worry about like the bootstrap slash square spacification of yeah. smart spaces, right? We can do things that are really kind of unique and, and interesting. Thanks. One of the things I've noticed also when I mean, as you say, it's like when you're designing for the screen, there's like a lot of standardized tools and standardized, unfortunately, ways of designing. Uh, and then you can move into things which are a bit more unique. And what I've really enjoyed is that in that case, like, you know, if you're, we had to create like a design language for a device that communicated yeah. through light patterns, and there's no tool for that. Um, and, what you, and obviously you can do it through Arduino and coding if you're proficient in that, but maybe the person who has like the stronger aesthetic sensibilities isn't able to design with an Arduino. So in that case, you, you realize that you need to design your own tool. You need to design a product mm -hmm. that means uh, somebody like you or you or you or whoever who doesn't know how to code the light pattern but definitely has a very strong point of view on how it should behave is able to design that as easily um, as we would all be designing screen interfaces. So I think that's one of the quite interesting things about these more unique experiences is that you, you get to design your own tool. Yeah. yeah. How do you design for something that you don't even know the specs of yet or you there don't you even know? <laughs> I mean, that, that seems to be kind of a challenge that we're all sort of facing, right? It's like, how do we design for these future experiences when we haven't even dreamed them up yet? Or, you know, like there is no interface or, or it comes in some kind of virtual space. So I think mm -hmm. it's fascinating. Um, I'll, sorry, just stick with this. Um, yeah. Unconventional. A lot of people have to think about these these things that aren't um, con like the the things that we don't think about as more tech type people. Things like um, doing touch interface, which we've done in like tractors, mm -hmm. big combines that people in fields in Iowa or Kansas or whatever are using. Um, being de designing these experiences so that it makes their jobs easier, quicker, more efficient. Um, things like uh, like uh, airplane uh, sprayers or chemical sprayers for things that we, as more tech-based people, just don't think about, that middle America or just someone who's not in the tech world uses every day. Mm -hmm. And UX is helpful in all the aspects, not just the websites and the mobile phones and the apps mm -hmm. that most people think of when they think of UX. Yep. Thanks. And so, yeah, so I think one of the things that I've heard a lot is like, you know, tools come and go and, you know, uh, mediums come and go, but like the experience, like the, the notion of experience design will stay because, you know, no matter what it ends up being, there, there will be a need to actually design what the experience is like. Um, and this is actually the, the, the last question I have before we, we actually take questions from the audience or, or uh, the attendees. Um, you know, l we've talked a little bit about like unconventional you know, UIs, and uh, so we're talking about the future and what's, what's to come. So I want to ask each of you, if you're, you know, in, in, in 60 seconds, uh, for each of you, uh, so what, what's, what's the advice you would give to, uh, to the audience here about, you know, or you know, uh, experienced designers to get ready for what's coming in the next five years? You know, like what? What, what do they, should uh, they think about? So for me, the things that I think about is culture, trends, and bias, right? So um, really thinking about the fact that we, we are focused on scaling, but we are America, right? So the things that we do in this country may not fit when we're thinking about the next billion users, right? And so really thinking about when you're doing your research, when you're doing your studies, who you're speaking to. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have noticed that I'm a black woman, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But it's really interesting in some of the research labs that we have the types of people who are coming in. And really, I tend to spend a lot of time focused on the screener and making sure that we have mixed uh, gender, mixed income, mixed uh, individuals who represent the world, really. So if we're thinking about building for the world, we need to really take a look at who we're speaking to and where we're doing our research. So think about San Francisco, for example. Um, there is some bias in doing research here, right? So I'll tend to go to Denver or to Vegas or Seattle where um, there's a better representation of what the world looks like. So really thinking about um, uh, diversifying the, the research 
and study participants, things like that, so that you can start preparing for five years and beyond. Yeah, I totally, I, I so agree with that. And I think even the research for me becomes super critical. I think all of us need to become better at research and like better at, I know for myself, I feel like I need to get even further back to that and to ethnography and into figuring out how to do prototypes with users a lot more. And so sort of like that co-design. So it's just being there and actually seeing people live. And so getting away from my desk a little bit and, and getting some of the tools out there is just gonna be really critical because we're just not, the devices are gonna be so different. They're gonna be a lot, likely a lot more ubiquitous and it's gonna be really more about how do these things fit into people's lives and less about the specific button style or is it flat or, or material or any of that kind of stuff. So that's pretty key for me, so. And for me, it's mainly that UX is gonna be incorporated into everything now. It's not just mm -hmm. the, the I've, said it a couple times already, it's not just the websites and the tech version, it's gonna be in the, uh, your smart wheels, like on a car, if you have like an app that says, oh, your phone is, or your tires popped on your mm -hmm. car dashboard or things like that, it's gonna be getting the best experience from anything. It's, and people know, that, and letting people know that in the UX field, you might not always be working on the sexiest of things. The, the coolest of interfaces. You might be working on that, uh, that tractor. <laughs> <laughs> it's not sexy, but it helps a lot of people and it, you feel good at the end of the day that you've made these great designs that, are, that everyday people are gonna be able to use. Cool. Um, you know, think about the next five years, like it, it'd be really easy to point to certain technologies like you know, VR and AR and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that they'll certainly play you know, more and more you know, important parts of our life. Um, you know, but if, if I was to ask myself, like, what should I invest my time in? Like, you know, where should I put my time? You know, I still think it's a boring answer, which is that design process, because it's that thing, yeah. like technology will come and go, mm -hmm. um, but that thing that you'll carry with you, that, that sort of gold that you'll bring from place to place to place, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is this process, like that is, it, that is the design. And so what's good about that is you can be objective about technology, you know, like pick up and throw away what's not useful. You know, like I might have said 15 years ago, like Adobe Flash, that's yeah. what you should do, and that and that was useful for a while. Like, yeah. no offense, um, <laughs> but yeah. but you know that it didn't it didn't match it didn't match a user's you know desire, and it sort of fell off the radar. But I, I think if you had maintained your sort of steady guard on your process, and then when it left, it would have left. You would have moved on to a new technology, and it wouldn't have mattered to you because you know it serves this desire that that, he, that the humans have, you know. Mm -hmm. And so so working on that thing is is what will kind of carry you, I think. So. Yeah, I mean, a, a bit like what you're saying is the cool thing about five years from now is everything's up for grabs because we don't know yeah. what it's going to be. So it could be VR, in which case we're designing, you know, cities and life forms, or it could be little earbuds with an AI in them, in which case we're designing, you know, personalities. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think we're always going to have this pattern of just like figuring out what is the experience that we're designing, and those tools are most likely always going to say the same, and it's going to be understanding how things connect, understanding what the user needs are. Um, and then when it gets to be more kind of medium specific, I mean, that will just depend on where we are five years from now. But you just want to be sure that you're asking the correct questions up front so that you have that creative confidence that you're designing the right thing and the, the tools that, you know, we all use uh, might not change that much in that respect. Yeah, it's going to come as no shock that the guy from IDEO says design process. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> honestly, uh, I, I, I would say, and this is, I think this will be true 10, 15, 20 years out, just as it is five years out, uh, in the work that you do, uh, make sure that you're adhering to a design process. And it's really easy to figure out whether or not you are, right? Because design is, at its core, about solving for human needs. Uh, if you look at your process, if you look at how you're solving for whatever a, a client is coming to you to solve for, and what you're really doing is designing only in service of business interests. That's not a design process, and that's not how to be prepared to do user experience design uh, for the next year, let alone the next five. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I mean, I, as we've sort of seen here tonight, the, I think that the things that are being asked of designers is just just growing, and I think it's going to continue to grow. And I think we we are going to be you know asked to think about our the impact that our decisions have think, on culture on 
people. Um, and so you know, a lot of that comes with responsibility of doing research and, and working through process. But I do also think that we are going to be asked more and more to think also about business and to think about the impact that our decisions can have kind of across the board. And I think, again, like being well versed, not, not, not just in, you know, uh, you know design, uh, but also technology, research, uh, and, and business is going to be really important for designers in the future. All right, thanks. Uh, so we have some questions that came through Twitter, so I'm, uh, I'm going to you know, ask you a few of those. Uh, one that we uh, actually, Donna, you touched on earlier about you know, talking about some of your UI, uh, your clients you know, being fixed on UI, but not really thinking about user experience per se and, and you know, task validation, et cetera. We have a question on that, which, which I'll read out is, how do you go uh, about trying to change from doing UI work and moving more into doing UX work? How would you go about getting employees and your boss on board uh, to doing the UX process? So. Um, for, the, for, for clients, it's, it's a lot of it is for them, at least in my experience, is giving them statistics that honestly that's going to show them that they're going to save money. It's, mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for clients, it's, it's, there was a study a while ago, I don't remember exactly who, but it's saying that like every dollar spent at UX in the beginning saves $100 or something in, um, mm -hmm. in support costs. Stuff like that, find, getting those statistics that, for at least for consulting, that gonna save money, and it all it, a lot of times it just boils down to the bottom line. Yeah, yeah, I think I'd echo that statement. I think you know, like working in client services in the past, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as a business owner, th there's any number of ways you can spend your money. You know, it could be about PR, it could be about uh, you know, a whole, whole bunch of different ways of solving that problem. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, you can't just be enamored in your own design process. Like it has to be about the value that they're gonna get. And it can't just be talking about like websites and whatever else. It's like, mm -hmm. what will the website get me? What will I get once I, I do this stuff? So I think yeah, focusing on that value is, is the only way because as a business owner, it, it, it wouldn't be prudent of you not to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. And if, if someone wasn't asking those questions, then maybe they aren't the best client. So uh. yeah, I think it's selling that like the value would, that's what I'd say as well. What's cool is it seems like it's sort of back to like what we ask our designers when we critique them. It's like, what's your goal with mm. this? And I think d design leaders and designers have sort of, to your point about sort of our connection with the business and technology and the design, we have that opportunity and that voice to be a critical thinker and to bring that to the clients, mm. which is so cool. So. Uh, so truthfully, I think, I think UI and UX for years now have been kind of needlessly conflated, right? Like so many people self-identify as UI UX designers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they're two, you know, UI can be a part of, of the user experience, but, but it's not, you know, yeah. it's not a necessary component. So truthfully, I, I would, you know, look to the aim of, of whatever your organization, right? If they don't believe in design as a core tenet, then maybe th this isn't the organization for you to be trying to, to force yeah. user experience design into. All right, thanks. Uh, we have time for one more question, and it's a great question, so I really want to make sure we, uh, we have a few minutes for this. Uh, so I'll read it out loud. So uh, how do you overcome client expectations versus user expectations? Hmm. Uh, when the project is, uh, is based on what the client, but not the, uh, the user is asking for. So how do you negotiate more research when you are uh, new in the field? So it's slightly related to the one, but it's, it's more about the tension between clients and, and user needs. Yeah. I don't know, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Because like, I think your job as a designer is to convince them that those aren't different. Yeah. They can't be two separate things, mm -hmm. because if they are, then you'll never get to a success. Mm -hmm. So that's like that selling thing that we were kind of talking about beforehand, that the first thing is that you will earn more money if your users love your product, and they come back, and they buy it, and they love it. So mm -hmm. it, it's not different. Um, so I think it's it's in those like those storytelling techniques to kind of you know push them together I guess like massage them you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I like to illustrate the worst case scenario with yeah. folks you know yeah, I worked nice. with uh, I consulted for a bit um, and I worked at Baxter and they were looking at uh, interfaces and they thought if we added more color that interfaces doctors would interact with um, it would just look cooler they just wanted something that doctors were interacting with to look cooler and so I was able to prove that. Each additional color, each additional curve, they use the word appley. Every appley thing you did lost 30 seconds and could lose a life. Is that what you want to do? <laughs> do you want to kill people? <laughs> right? So if you can try to get it back to killing people, then okay. <laughs> you're winning. <laughs> um, truthfully, we, we, uh, 
we work to set expectations up front. We, we, uh, we let the client know that, that there are points in, in our process where they're going to freak out, right? Uh, we actually have a little graphic that we use where we show you know, kind of their emotion on the y-axis over time on the mm -hmm. x-axis, and awesome. there are points where it dips way low. Yeah. Uh, we, we, uh, in our process, we tend to, we call it kind of diverging and then converging, right? So diverging would, for instance, be our poor project lead having to explain to the client why we're expensing a skydiving trip. Uh, and then the converging, of course, is, is you know, taking the, the best insights gleaned from that experience and, and subsequent interview uh, to then craft a product uh, that's really helpful for people that doesn't look anything like skydiving. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it tends to be easier with clients with whom we have kind of long-standing uh, relationship where, where they've gone yeah. through our process uh, more than once and, and they already have those expectations going in, but by all means let them know that a lot of this is really fuzzy, right? A lot of this doesn't necessarily look like it will immediately serve the best needs of your business, but mm -hmm. in the end, you know, it is about crafting the best products that we're able. All right. Well, I want to thank every one of you for uh, you know, joining us tonight and answering uh, all those questions. I think it's been very inspiring. I want to thank the audience as well and everybody who's uh, following us uh, online. And uh, with that, have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.